BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. All right, hello everybody. Today is Friday. Another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? What can I say? This has been a year that has been filled with true crime discoveries. And I think that it's more than a year. Over the next decade, perhaps we will find the answers to a lot of mysteries, cold cases, and even stories and legends. A lot of the questions that people have will be answered. So says me, anyway. And to all of the people out there who think that the chase is more fun than the catch, I will respectfully disagree. I think that it is very good to get answers to these questions and to learn the truth because that's what a lot of us in the true crime world are just hoping to not only discover but also experience and it is all about the victims at a certain point to allow the stories to reach their end for the families of the victims to get closure and to be able to say rest in peace with sincerity. And on the most recent Monday show, which is the Zodiac Killer News Report, I listed off several true crime cases which have been more or less solved, as well as missing persons cases. The disappearance of Brandon Lawson reached its uh, conclusion earlier this year, as well as the identification of the Somerton Man. I also talked about the Artesia Jane Doe, who had been identified as Cadence Langley, and... There was even a case back in 2019 that I learned about the story of Horseshoe Harriet, who was um, um, an unidentified murder victim of the serial killer Robert Christian Hansen, who operated in Alaska. He was known as the Butcher Baker, and when I first learned about her story, I thought, I just wanted to do a deep dive segment, like a regular segment, trying to uncover the mystery about who was this person. And that hasn't been in the last 12 months, but in the the last 15 months, Horseshoe Harriet was identified as Robin Pelkey. And even though I didn't do the most thorough job, I mean, I'm just glad that there is an answer now. And a lot of this goes back to the identification of the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, because genetic genealogical DNA examinations were involved And DNA is so vital to solving these cases, and it provides so many answers. However, the disappearance of Brandon Lawson was not solved with DNA, it was rather solved with just locating his physical remains. So there are different ways that true crime cases and missing persons cases can be solved, and I'm hoping just one day, someway, somehow, we will get an answer in the Zodiac Killer mystery as well as perhaps the Long Island serial killer mystery, the Phantom Killer mystery, and of course Jack the Ripper. But with today's episode, I would like to focus on one of America's oldest cold cases, and that is the story of the boy in the box. I did one older recording about this back in 2019, what I like to call an old-fashioned gray box recording, where there was just um, the pure podcast audio-only version. But that one is still up online, but to recap some of the info that I shared, I was talking about how I became familiar with this story, and I learned about the boy in the box the same way that I learned about the Zodiac Killer, and that was from the show America's Most Wanted. I grew up in a divorced 
family. My parents uh, separated when I was seven, so I would spend Monday through Friday with my mother and then Saturday and Sunday with my father. And on Saturday nights, we didn't have cable or anything. We just had Fox 5, and that's what I would watch because that was on the TV. Cops at 8 o'clock, two episodes, and America's Most Wanted at 9. And I became just a regular true crime follower from a very early age. And I remember watching the story about the boy in the box, and they said that a case that has been unsolved for 41 years. It's done in that very dramatic fashion, but it does get your attention. 41 years. And that was in 1998. However, it turned out it would take 65 years to identify the boy in the box. And this is a recent true crime discovery and the boy in the box has been identified as Joseph Augustus Zarelli. And for once, he has a name given to him. I mean, the first time in 65 years that people are calling him by his name. And rest in peace to uh, this child who did not deserve to die in this way. And I'm going to go over to an article from the Washington Post that came out just recently. This one was written by Pravina Samazdaram just citing the source. It was a fall day in 1998 when the manager of a Pennsylvania cemetery watched as the casket was laid beside a new headstone inscribed with America's Unknown Child for what would be the final resting place of a boy that was found in a cardboard box in 1957. I just hope that we're all here one day to see his name put on the stone, he recalled an investigator saying to him after the service. For more than two decades since, a man named Drysdale walked past the grave every day on the way to his office, wondering who the boy was. Sixty-five years after the boy was first found naked and bruised on the side of a Philadelphia road, police identified him as Joseph Augustus Sorelli. His body was exhumed from the Ivy Hill Cemetery in 2019 so that DNA samples could go through modern genealogical testing, which ultimately led to the discovery of his birth certificate, officials said. Joseph would have been four years old at the time when he was found dead. The name of Philadelphia's boy in the box is another clue in the mystery that many have wondered about for decades. And I do have to throw in a particular interjection at one point. All right, part of the mystery has been solved. He has been identified as Joseph Augustus Sorelli but that does not mean that the perpetrator has been identified, and that part of the case is still open, and I hope that an additional element will be uncovered soon about who committed this murder, even if the killer is already dead and long gone. I think most of us would still like to know who was behind the murder of the boy in the box. Many of the case's original detectives died without ever knowing it, leaving those in the community and beyond thinking that there might never be an update in the child's case, but as you can see, his story was never forgotten, said Police Commissioner Danielle Outlaw. Yes, the police commissioner's last name is Outlaw. That's rather odd. Police are still investigating Joseph's death as a homicide. His cause of death was more than likely blunt force trauma, said Jason Smith, a commanding officer of the Philadelphia Police Homicide Unit. And I listened back to the old episode that I did in 2019, and I shared, again, some things about how I learned about the case. First, watching it on America's Most Wanted as a kid, and then reading up on it years later, and putting some of those pieces together. There was one story that a man had set some illegal animal traps in the woods, and that he stumbled upon this cardboard box, which was for a bassinet actually like a baby's bassinet and there was this dead boy inside but he didn't want to completely tell the authorities all the details because he didn't want them to confiscate his animal traps but then the story that was shared on america's most wanted is that there was some guy who was being a little bit pervy and he was spying on some teenage girls and they shouted at him go away you pervert and then he started running through the woods and then he stumbled upon the box that had this dead boy in it. So, I mean, those sto stories don't necessarily contradict each other. I just wanted to share some things that I had heard in the past about the way the boy in the box was discovered. Officials did not reveal the identities of Joseph's parents, who they said have died, or any of the suspects. Joseph has living siblings, but they were also not named. That, I think, is for the best. 
Joseph has a number of living siblings on them, both the mother's and father's sides, who are living, and out of respect for them and their parents, the information shall remain confidential. I think that that is the only, the only appropriate thing to do, because those people, most likely, most likely, did not have any connection to this. I mean, I don't really know, but innocent until proven guilty. However, they're just people living their lives at this point. They are private citizens, and to pull them into some type of media storm when they most likely had no clue what was going on. Philadelphia police found Joseph's remains on February 25th of 1957 after a man saw a box in the woods near a road in the northeast part of the city. The child had blue eyes and brown hair that had been cl cut close to the scalp and was so malnourished that the authorities could not determine his exact age. And again, to share some stuff that I talked about in the past, there were a couple competing theories as to what happened to Joseph. However, one thing that almost everybody was in agreement on is that his hair was cut to conceal his identity because even in 1957, the authorities could determine that it was cut post-mortem. And again, he had been beaten and he died from blunt force trauma. And when you look at the photos, um, and even some of the black and white recreations of Joseph Sorelli, it is very horrific and just um saddening. But if his hair had been cut post mortem, I mean, why would that happen? Funeral parlors do arrange and prepare the bodies in particular ways, but that doesn't quite seem to be the case that someone would do this out of respect if he had been murdered and left in a cardboard box in the forest. I mean, he wasn't given any type of proper burial or memorial he was just tossed out so that doesn't seem to coincide that's why almost everyone believes that his hair was cut post-mortem to alter his identity if photos or images were going around something like a uh, wanted poster missing persons poster can you identify this person then the neighbors or anybody who had seen joseph when he was living would not be able to identify him because his appearance would have looked substantially different. After an autopsy, Joseph was buried for the first time at a Pottersfield city plot, but this plot was the only one to read Heavenly Father Bless This Unknown Boy. In October of 1998, police received court permission to exhume the body and retrieve DNA samples, but the testing that followed and the hundreds of tips that came across the country led to nowhere. As I said, 1998 was the, the time of the America's Most Wanted episode, and even though that show wasn't perfect, it did reignite a certain amount of interest in a lot of cold cases. As I said, that's how I learned about the Zodiac Killer mystery from America's Most Wanted and John Walsh. Even though it turned out that he was a little bit of a foe as opposed to a friend to um, the world of Zodiac research, but he did, again, reignite interest within the general public on the subject, and with the boy in the box case, it seems exactly the same. Joseph was reburied at Ivy Hill at the request of the Philadelphia Police and the Vidoc Society, a group of experts that work on cold cases. The cemetery gave the boy a plot right by its entrance. Every February since the case began, an investigator would come back to the grave to pay the respects, and the headstone read, America's Unknown Child. I'm sure a lot of you are curious about the theories in the case as to what happened to Joseph, and in this episode I will be talking about some ones that are the ones that people had in the past that most likely could have also been ruled out, but just to share them as part of the overall process. However, let's go back to the rearrangement. No matter what, a man is walking through the woods and he encounters this bassinet box that has the remains of a malnourished and beaten boy who has had his hair cut post-mortem. The first theory that comes from um, just the most basic Wikipedia source is the foster home theory. This theory concerns a foster home that was located approximately 1.5 miles from the site of the body. In 1960, Remington Bristow, an employee of the medical examiner's office, who pursued the case until his death in 1993, contacted a New Jersey psychic who told him to look for a house that matched the foster home's description. When the psychic was brought to the Philadelphia Discovery site, she led Bristow directly to the home. Well, I don't really um entertain that type of thinking too much, anything about 
psychic detectives. What I think is much more fascinating in that one is that the foster home was identified, some child who's been abused and neglected in a foster home, and that's why he was put into the bassinet box, which may have been the bassinet for a different baby in the foster home. But from the new information that has been coming out, although we do not know who Joseph's parents were or his siblings, what has been shared in some of the new sources is that he was the child of a rather well-off family in the Philadelphia area. So I don't think this foster home theory is going to hold up too much. And it even says here, however, the police established that all the foster children were accounted for and re-examination by police investigators confirmed that the family was likely not involved. And I think that the new discovery ties into that exactly. So this foster home angle is most likely ruled out. The next one is the woman known as Martha or M. Another theory was brought forward in February of 2002 by a woman identified only as Martha. Police considered her story to be plausible, but were troubled by her testimony as she had a history of mental illness. M claimed that her abusive mother had purchased the unknown boy, whose name was Jonathan, from his parents in the summer of 1954. Subsequently, the boy was subjected to extreme physical and sexual abuse for about two and a half years. One evening at dinner, the boy vomited up his meal of baked beans and was given a severe beating with his head slammed against the floor until he was semi-conscious. He was given a bath during which he died. These details match the information known only to the police as the coroner found that the boy's stomach contained a meal that was most likely baked beans and that his fingers were water-wrinkled. I mean, those are some strong details, but as we know now, the boy's name was not Jonathan. It was Joseph, so... That also is something that doesn't hold up too well. M's mother cut the boy's distinctive long hair, which accounted for the unprofessional haircut that pe the police noted in the investigation. In an effort to conceal his identity, M's mother forced her to assist in the dumping of the body in the Fox Chase area of Philadelphia. M said that they were preparing to remove the boy's body from the trunk of a car when a passing male motorist alongside inquired whether or not they needed help. M was ordered to stand in front of the car's license plate to shield it, while the mother convinced the would-be Good Samaritan that there was no problem, and eventually the man drove off. This story corroborated confidential testimony by a male witness in 1957 who said that the body had been placed in a box, in the, in a box previously discarded at the scene. Well, um, I mean, it does seem like some of this is coming together, but we have to bear in mind that this is 2002 when she's saying this, and the boy in the box made national news in 1998, or not exactly news, but it aired on national television, and even I was watching it, that story. So could she not have read up on the case in some particular way? Or maybe, maybe based on all of the hundreds, if not thousands of people who are saying something about the case, she just got lucky by saying that he ate baked beans. Or maybe that's a common thing that people would have had for... I mean, I ate baked beans growing up, and um, it doesn't take too much imagination to talk about the bath. However, not getting the name right, I mean, Jonathan versus Joseph, you could see how someone's memory might slip a little bit, but still, that's that's a strike against this person's particular story. Other theories. Forensic artist Frank Bender developed a theory that the victim may have been raised as a girl and the child's unprofessional haircut was performed in haste and was the basis for the scenario as well as the appearance of the eyebrows having been styled. In 2008, Bender released a sketch of, an, of the unidentified child with long hair reflecting the strands found on the body. So, this is one that people have um, been discussing even recently. Was there some type of of even darker reason about why the boy's hair was cut post-mortem. And that's just it, that not only is it to disguise his appearance, it would have been to disguise his appearance majorly in a very, very drastic way, because everyone would be thinking that this family had a girl, but that they were actually raising a boy and putting him in girls' clothing, and then some way, somehow, some type of tragedy took place or some type of issue took place. Now, I don't know if there's a lot of evidence to support that other than the odd haircut, but um, I'll say some more about this particular theory later on. 
In 2016, two writers, one from Los Angeles, California, named Jim Hoffman, and the other from New Jersey, named Louis Romano, believed that they had discovered a potential identity from Memphis, Tennessee, and requested that DNA be compared between family members and the child. The lead originally discovered by a Philadelphia man who introduced Romano and Hoffman to each other was developed and presented with the help of Hoffman to the Philadelphia Police Department in early 2013. In 2013, Romano became aware of the lead and agreed to help the man from Philadelphia and Hoffman to obtain DNA from this particular family member in January of 2014, which was sent to the Philadelphia Police Department. Local authorities confirmed that they would investigate the lead, but they said that they would need to do more research on the circumstances surrounding the link to the Memphis connection before comparing the DNA. In de December of 2017, Homicide Sergeant Bob Kuhlmeyer confirmed that DNA had been taken from a Memphis man and was compared to the Fox Chase boy, and there was no connection. Now, I think unless they have some type of pre-existing reason, that is not even just needle in the haystack. That is just, I mean, shooting into the ocean and hoping that you're going to hit the smallest of targets. I mean, the needle in the haystack probably has a higher chance of being true. So, I think that um, that isn't the most valuable approach, and it does show that there was no connection. And there also is one that I um, heard about recently on one of the news clips that was shared. I want to say it was from ABC7, but uh, don't quote me on that. When they talked about how there was this theory that he was a Hungarian immigrant, and uh, there was just no documentation of him, and he was murdered, and that's why they couldn't identify him. But Joseph Augustus Sorelli doesn't appear to have been Hungarian at all, so that just seems like another theory that... Um, but it's probably not bad intention, it just didn't turn out to be true. And it does make you wonder about the particular um, conditions. Out of all of these theories that I've read, the um, Martha M. theory seems to be somewhat of the most plausible, except for the fact that she got the name wrong. I mean, talking about all of these um, details, but it really begs the question about why would they even bring the child along with them, like Martha M, to, or I guess M is um, the child, to the dump site when that would just be a hindrance rather than helping? I mean, this definitely would have been something that the woman in question could have done herself. And uh, Joseph Sorelli was three feet six inches tall when he passed away. And, I mean, he. this definitely would have been a job that could have been done by the woman herself, and I think that bringing another child along would just create more problems than it would solve. And here is something that isn't easy to talk about, but it does need a certain amount of reiteration, and I've dealt with a lot of people who have shared their true crime theories with me on this channel, and I'm definitely scaling back the amount that I do of that because some people just seem absolutely deranged. And I'm not diagnosing anyone, but they seem like they're out of their minds. And they have very well put together and articulate theories. But then the more that I talk to them, the more incoherent they become or this, the less and less of an ability they have to show their abilities to express themselves, and it all just kind of gets blended in together into very emotional and borderline incoherent ramblings, and it just goes out of control. And, yeah, I do believe that some of those people have genuine mental illnesses that are fueling their ability to say that they have solved even the highest of true crime cases beyond the boy in the box, but also the Zodiac Killer mystery, of course, the Phantom Killer mystery, as well as perhaps even some of the older cool cases out there, and they just think that they have all of these pieces of knowledge that have been obtained, but in very abstract ways, and again, at first they can put together lots of sentences. And I was even contacted by someone once who was sharing a true crime theory with me about the Zodiac Killer, and I was really captivated by what she had to say, and then later that day I got some more comments on YouTube, and it was a man writing saying, 
I'm the owner of this account. That was my sister using it who has schizophrenia, and she does not have permission to use my computer, but she did anyway. Please disregard all the comments. And, you know, just because someone has a mental illness, it doesn't mean they cannot create stories. So it, it, it's an almost impossible um, equation to solve or balance to find out, you know, like where are other people's ideas coming from. But I just wanted to point out that sometimes people are telling the truth, sometimes people are liars, and sometimes people aren't aware of what the truth or what the lie is. There are deranged people out there. And this story, like if you were just to read this thing on its own, the story of Martha and M, it sounds very plausible. Well, okay, I mean, she knew all these details about the case because she was the one involved with the disposal of the body and it was all orchestrated by her parents. But now that we know the identity of the boy in the box, she got the name wrong. And we also have to be aware that she might have just been lucky by stating that he ate baked beans before he died. So I couldn't, um, I wouldn't jump to, to too many conclusions, even if I do think that it's presented in somewhat of um, an easy to understand way at face value. And I would also want to share something with you guys that there is a YouTube channel out there that is run by David Gold, and he did an episode recently on The Boy in the Box and this recent discovery that he's been identified as Joseph Augustus Sorelli. And David Gold is someone who is the author of My Dance with the Zodiac Killer, which promotes the story that the Zodiac murders of the 1960s were organized by three people, Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin, and they were involved with a host of other crimes throughout the 20th century, most notably the 1962 escape from Alcatraz and other um, high-profile crimes such as D.B. Cooper and the Phantom Killings of 1946. But when it came to the boy in the box, even David Gold said that his Zodiac suspects were not responsible for it, and that he said that he knew the guys personally and discussed it with them, but even he said that they were not responsible for this crime. However, it was just rather appalling, if it were indeed true, that this boy was forced to live as a girl, and that some type of issue or dispute happened because of that, and he was murdered for that particular reason. So, um, I just wanted to share that, and you can watch his video about the boy in the box available um, here on YouTube. And I would also just like to give some final um, final comments that have been shared on the AP News. It's called Philly Slain Boy in the Box Years Later Now Has a Name. And this was written by Michael Rubencom, just citing the source. His name was Joseph Augustus Sorelli. Nearly 66 years after the battered body of a young boy was found stuffed inside a cardboard box, Philadelphia police say they finally have unlocked a central mystery in the city's most notorious cold case, the victim's identity. And yes, that is just the beginning of this, because they still do not know who was responsible for the murder. Revealing the name to the public Thursday, authorities hope that it will help them stop, step closer to the boy's killer and give the victim, known to generations, as the boy in the box, a measure of dignity. And I also want to share something that I read on one of the earliest news articles, if not the first one that I pulled up once I saw the headline that the boy in the box murder had been solved, and that is that the authorities have stated, again, just in the vaguest of terms, that they have a pretty good idea of what happened, but they don't want to reveal it yet because they are not certain. I don't know if that's just double talk or not, but I hope they are telling the truth, and if they're just trying to accumulate more evidence... Let's see. When people think about the boy in the box, a profound sadness is felt. Not just because a child was murdered, but because his entire identity and his rightful claim to existence was taken away, Philadelphia Police Commissioner Danielle Outlaw said at a news conference. She said the city's oldest unsolved homicide has haunted the community and the Philadelphia Police Department and our nation for more than six decades. The homicide investigation remains open, and authorities said that they helped they hoped publicizing Joseph's name would spur a fresh round of leads, but they cautioned the passage of time that it takes to complete the tasks. It's going to be an uphill battle for us to definitively determine who caused the child's death, said Captain Jason Smith, a commanding officer of the homicide unit. 
we may not make an arrest, we may never make an identification, but we're going to do our darndest to try. And that is um honestly what I think a lot of people have been thinking and experiencing when it comes to certain true crime cases. I mean, look at the Jack the Ripper mystery that has been unsolved since 1888, and we may never get a true answer as to what happened with the Whitechapel murders as well as something such as the murder of the boy in the box, because it might be a task that will be too difficult to solve, or the evidence that existed back in 1957 might no longer be present. But I want to approach the story with a sense of optimism and hope that if they were able to identify the boy in the box as Joseph Augustus Sorelli, then perhaps they might be able to find out more about what happened to him. If he had living, if he has living siblings currently, they must be able to provide something. You would expect that at least one of them would have a clear memory of when Joseph disappeared, and there would be some way, somehow, to trace information between different individuals, and even among a group of individuals. We're talking about a larger social circle. We might not get the answers immediately, but I'm hopeful that they will find them in the near future. And lastly, I would like to give a shout out to CD, who was the first person to share this news with me in the comment section here on YouTube that the boy in the box had been identified, and this is going to be counted as another strong true crime discovery for the year of 2022, and I'm hoping that more cases will be solved over the next months and years. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box, and there is always BlackboxNid88 over on Instagram, and I will see you over there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.